Hello, I'm Sunil Rao, Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center and co-chair of the SCAI Quality Committee. Thanks for joining us. And here with me is uh, Ajay Kirtane. Ajay, do you want to um, go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Ajay Kirtane, uh, interventionalist and uh, assistant professor of clinical medicine at Columbia University. Um, also uh, do our quality improvement in the cath lab here at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital at Columbia. Uh, happy to be here tonight. Great. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the updated methodology for the AUC document. Uh, and as all of you know, it's appropriate use criteria. It's really a hot topic right now in interventional cardiology and actually throughout cardiology because there have been appropriate use criteria released for a variety of different tests uh, and procedures. So Ajay, I want to get your thoughts a little bit about uh, appropriate use in general and then maybe we can talk a little bit about some of um, maybe the drawbacks of the previous methodology or the previous AUC document. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this has been a big issue for interventionalists in particular. Um, you know, the ACC is, is well-intentioned here. What they were essentially trying to do is to identify clinical scenarios where it was reasonable to do certain things and not reasonable to do other things and to essentially codify that and to go beyond the guidelines in a way that clinicians would be able to understand it. Well, I think what has happened, at least from the interventional perspective, is that while that's been accomplished, the categorization of patients into sort of three categories, appropriate, uncertain, and inappropriate, um, with actual lay connotations to those words, that I think in a large extent it go beyond what the committees meant when they actually tried to devise these criteria in the first place, really has left a lot of interventionalists kind of high and dry and feeling that you know, the clinical complexity that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is not well represented. And then and there are times when you feel like you should be doing a procedure to help somebody, and yet somebody on the outside might be telling you, an administrator or otherwise, that it's inappropriate to do that procedure and that the problem in that case of doing it is that you might even not get paid for it. And so that's been an issue of a lot of consternation for interventionalists, and that's kind of the backdrop to what we're seeing. And the reason we're talking about it today is because the ACC has recently updated those definitions. And maybe, Sunil, you know, what are your thoughts on this, these updates and some of the other things in the document as well that are really important that clinicians might not actually go beyond just the updated definitions? Yeah, I think the AUC committee and the task force deserves a lot of credit because I think they have answered some of the the, uh, the drawbacks that you've outlined, specifically with relation to the terminology that that's now being used, the terminology is in, has been updated. Um, it, the the word inappropriate has now been changed to rarely appropriate. The uncertain category now is called may be appropriate. I think those are uh, much better terms than before. I, I think the methodology that was used in the original document was based on validated methods from the Rand group. The problem is that not everyone is familiar with that, and as you uh, mentioned the lay press really sort of had a field day with uh, the, the, those terms. I think the, um, the, the, the problem, of course, is that um, you know, these kinds of things are going to be going uh, sort of going forward, uh, not looking back. So it'll be interesting to see how some of the categorization of the procedures change as the new definitions are applied. But I think one big uh, message, take-home message from the document really is that even procedures that may be categorized as rarely appropriate, as you mentioned, uh, Ajay, sometimes do apply in the individual patient. And one of the caveats the document makes is that documentation of exactly why you're doing the procedure is really, really important. And that's something that we in the Quality Committee have really tried to encourage uh, uh, clinicians out there is that, you know, if you're applying your best clinical judgment, you really have to document that in the chart very, very carefully before you, uh, you uh, proceed with your procedure. Well, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's <laughs> great take-home advice. You know, we've heard of labs, for instance, nearby us that, uh, you know, if the patient doesn't meet appropriate criteria, if, if they're categorized, that patients are just being taken off the table and not being treated. And that's not the answer here. I mean, when we're trying to take care of patients, we want to take care of the patient, not the criteria. On the other hand, if you have a patient that might not meet a scenario, write that in the chart. Explain what you're thinking. You know, go back and write down the results of the stress test and why they were somewhat equivocal. I think that's a real big take-home message. I think the other thing that's in the document as well and, and clearly written is a, a codification, if you will, of the methodology 
behind how this gets done. And that's really important to have done transparently. I actually was uh, participating in the uh, diagnostic cath appropriateness document, uh, which as you said, is not going to be changed. The current document is not going to be changed. So these changes are only going forward. But in that document, there were pretty clear ways that this was not only codified but went forward in a process with review from societies and careful uh, you know, identification of the scenarios. And that's a really important finding and that's an important thing for people to be able to see that is being done in a rational way. Any other wrap-up points, Sunil, that you think that people ought to know about this document? Yeah, I think two final points. Number one is that uh, the, the, the group that wrote the, t the document once again has underscored that these are clinical decisions. They should not be used as the basis for reimbursement or, or payment schemes. And I think that's a really important thing. It's really to help guide clinicians. And the final thought I'd say is that I'd ask the audience to sort of stay tuned. The uh, Sky QIT, the Sky Kit, the, the Quality Toolkit will be updated to reflect some of the new changes in the AUC methodology. Oh, I think that's great. And, and thanks for having me on today. Absolutely.